Good morning, brothers. Uh, I'm d delighted to have this opportunity to spend this time together and to offer some uh, thoughts uh, that you might consider and take with you, perhaps uh, pray with, or at least uh, journey with over these remaining days, especially of the Lenten uh, season. Uh, when uh, uh, Dr. Bergsma invited all of us to put our hands up if we wanted to go to heaven, I saw most hands up. Not every hand was raised, but I, I don't know what that meant. But, uh, but anyway, um, I, I thought of a story. It, it, it's a true story. Uh, for several summers, I would go with some friends vacationing in, in New England. And as we would drive up, we would stop in uh, the beautiful New England town of Bennington, Vermont. I'm sure some of you have been there. It's just a gorgeous, picturesque place. And, and in the center of the town is the uh, typical uh, New England town green. And on the town green is this quintessential New England church, a white clapboard church, and uh, just looks like typical New England. And then it has a graveyard, a churchyard on the one side and in the back. In fact, we found out we, we, we would stop there. We should just stretch a bit and walk around, and we'd walk around in that cemetery. And in the back is the tomb or the grave uh, of Robert Frost famous uh, American poet and his family. But what really attracted my attention was a very old grave in the front of this uh, cemetery uh, in Bennington. And it, it, it was very worn, the, the, the granite of the headstone. But on it, you could read these words. And I know that this is not the only t uh, tombstone that has these words, but, but they're beautiful and a sober reminder of our mortality. So I read it, and each time we would go through Bennington, we'd stop there to walk around, and I would go to that grave and read that tombstone. And it says this, Remember man who passes by, as you are now, so once was I. As I am now, so you will be. Prepare yourself to follow me. A sobering reminder of our mortality and how we live is important as to where we'll go. Well, one year we stopped and I went typically to read that tombstone and in front of it was like a popsicle stick in the ground with a card inside of it, just an index card and then a baggie over it, I guess to protect it from rain and the weather. And it, it got my curiosity peaked. So I went up close to the tombstone and I read that little index card that some clever person had placed there. And the index card said this, to follow you, I'm not content until I know which way you went. <laughs> so, a good thought. We, we want to be heading in the right direction, and I hope today's conference uh, will be um, an opportunity to help all of us be moving in the right direction so that when we do depart this world, there'll be no question about which way we went. Huh? Um, public service announcement. announcement um, Sometimes during my presentations, there have been miracles. Uh, usually maybe within the first 10 minutes of a talk I've given, there have been cures. People with insomnia have been cured. And, <laughs> and so if anyone finds themselves being taken by a nap, uh, please report it to me afterwards, because I like to keep track of those cures. So, all right, thank you. Great, good. Well, let, let's, let's begin with, with prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Gracious and loving Father, we turn to you and raise our hearts, our minds, our very selves to you. We pray that along with your precious Son, you would send the power of your Holy Spirit, the grace of your Holy Spirit to enlighten us, to be with us, to move our minds, our hearts, our souls. Speak to us, Father, through the words that I've prepared, but most importantly is the message you want my brothers to hear. Help us by the power of your Spirit to stop grasping anything that is an obstacle to the free flowing of your abundant grace in our lives. May your spirit teach us and convince us that you alone are sufficient. You, O oh Lord, are enough for us as we journey through this life. May we ask for, receive, and cooperate with the grace of detachment, Father, as we walk this journey, especially in these later days of Lent, and as we prepare to celebrate the great mystery of salvation, the paschal mystery of your son's death and resurrection, by which we are saved. These things we ask in his name, who is Lord forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Mary, Mother of the Church, 
pray for us. Well, this talk is about the parable of the prodigal son and a lesson in detachment. I've been thinking about detachment uh, because in my own life, and you know the things that have been going on, and I'm kind of at the forefront there in these things, and it's really caused me to be detached from things that I might really want to be grasping on, the illusion that I'm in control of the church, or I'm in control of, uh, of what's going on around me. And, and so detachment has been something I've been thinking about and praying about when I was asked to give a presentation. It was sort of natural that I gravitated to that. And I'd like to present the parable of the prodigal son in a way, we've all heard it how many times, just last Sunday. I didn't realize when I uh, chose the parable of the prodigal son that it was, would be last Sunday's gospel, uh, the fourth Sunday of Lent in cycle C, which we find ourselves, Laetare Sunday this year, uh, was the parable of the prodigal son. Um, so I'd like to first focus a little bit on that, that whole notion of detachment. What do we mean by that, both biblically and in our uh, history of Catholic spirituality? What does it mean to be detached? And then secondly, to look at this familiar parable as a lesson that teaches detachment, especially in the figure of the Father. So um, let's begin by the Old Testament examples. And the very first thing that I would point out that's actually not on the outline is the fall of our first parents. What is that story about? The serpent devil uh, appears to our first parents, and uh, they have one commandment in the garden, don't touch and don't eat the fruit of the tree in the middle, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And of course, Satan plants the, the lie and says, well, he doesn't want you to eat that because you will be like gods if you. So what do they do? They grasp the fruit. They touch it. They were told not to touch it. They touch it. They take it and possess it. They hold on to the forbidden fruit. And I would say, my brothers, that that's the beginning of a problem you and I all have because of original sin. We want to grasp and hold on and to possess. Isn't it interesting that at the end of our Lord's time on earth, before he uh, leaves the table of the Last Supper, he gives the command not to take something, but take and eat, take and drink. Put this into your hands and into your bodies as your food and as your drink. Because when we have Christ, when the Lord is alive within us and we possess that treasure, his life, then we're less grasping about the other things, less attached, more detached to things that don't matter unto eternity. They may be good in themselves, but they can get in the way of our discipleship with Jesus Christ. So beginning with the grasping, the touching, and the taking and holding on to that fruit, we have our Lord telling us what we need to hold on to, what we need to take into our hands and into ourselves. There are other amazing examples of detachment in the pages of the Hebrew Scriptures. Genesis 12 and Abraham, my goodness, uh, he's told to go forth from your land, from your relatives, from the, the house of your father. And, and set out on a journey, and he doesn't have a destination, and he doesn't know how long it's going to take, but he goes. A lesson in detachment. The great patriarch Abraham leaves everything behind, takes his immediate family, and sets out, and all he knows is God's going to tell him where to go along the way. The second thing, of course, an amazing story, and it's, it's, it's astounding, is Genesis 22. And when we hear it, I know we're kind of, you get slack-jawed that God would ask Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac, the son of the promise. Not only would he be taking the life of his only son, but it was the son of the promise. He was promised to have, uh, you know, uh, 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 descendants as numerous as the sands of the sea. And the only descendant he has at this moment is Isaac. And if he takes that life, what about the promise that I'm going to have all these descendants? But Abraham trusts God. He's actually detached from this tender relationship with his son. And he's willing to go to Mount Moriah and sacrifice Isaac. What detachment. The wandering in the desert, the 40 years of, of God's people, is really a lesson, too, in detachment. I mean, they, they've got no place to call their own. They're on their way to the promised land. 
but they don't even have permanent housing, right? Everything they have is temporary. They put up a hut or a tent, and there's nothing to grasp onto, nothing to hold onto. And they don't pass the test all of the time. They're grumbling and, and turning to God and say, oh, you, we should have left us back in Egypt. It was better. Like, heck, it was better. They were going to die in Egypt. Every male child was supposed to be killed. So they were, they were going to go extinct. But they kept thinking, oh, it was much better back in Egypt. They wanted to grasp and possess what they had before. But God is saying, open your hands, let go. And I'll, I'll show you what you need to possess. And the possession is the promised land eventually when they get there after their desert wanderings. And then there's a curious story about Ezekiel. And these are only a few incidences of detachment in the Old Testament. But in Ezekiel 24, God says to Ezekiel, I'm taking from you the delight of your eyes and do not mourn. The delight of his eyes was his lovely wife. And that night, his wife dies. And Ezekiel, in obedience to God, doesn't go through the normal mourning, doesn't put on sackcloth and ashes and rip his clothes and sit on the ground. And the people are astounded, what's the matter? You know, your, your wife died, you should be showing the normal signs of grieving. And he says, God told me not to. He's detached, both from the customs of sorrow and even from his beloved wife. There's a, a, a detachment that Ezekiel shows here in obedience to God. Certainly our blessed mother. No question about our blessed mother's detachment. Whatever her plans were as a 12, 13, maybe 14-year-old young virgin in the town of Nazareth, she had dreams. She had something the way she thought her life might, might unfold. And all of a sudden, the angelic messenger comes, and Gabriel tells her that of all women, she's going to be the mother of God. And that turns everything upside down. Nothing is going to be according to her plans anymore. It's all going to be according to God's plan. She's got to open her hands and say, I'm not going to grasp onto anything except the will of God. And so she says those beautiful words, let it be done to me as you have said. A beautiful model for us of detachment, even from her own dreams, her own will. She accepts God will, God's will uh, for her. Now, the whole of Jesus' life can be seen as a detachment. We have the magnificent hymn uh, that St. Paul probably borrowed. It might have been existing, but he makes it a Christological hymn in the second chapter of his letter to the Philippians, and it talks about the emptying of Christ. But those beautiful words that, uh, that our Lord did not deem equality with the Father, equality with God, something to be grasped but rather he emptied himself. He emptied, he opened his hands and he became incarnate, taking on everything that's human except sin. Because sin wasn't supposed to be human in the first place. It's, it's, a, it's a disorientation of our humanity that happened in the garden. So he takes on everything that is human. He takes on our human nature, but remaining God, but he doesn't grasp at his divinity. So the whole life of our Lord is something of a non-attachment. Right? Um, the, 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 uh, um, the only, only by detachment could Jesus offer the, his total consent to his Father's will, and that's the drama in the garden, huh? the garden of agony, the garden of Gethsemane, um, not my will, but your will. You know, I, I would like this cup to pass me by, but I'm not that attached. I will say, Father, let your will be done. Whatever it is, I'll drink the cup if that's what you want me to do. So our Lord not only lived detachment from the very mystery of his incarnation throughout his life in obedience to the Father, but he also taught detachment. Our Lord taught about detachment. And we have here some examples, and only three really. Matthew chapter 6, um, he says, you know, you cannot serve God and mammon. Mammon meaning money or material goods. It's one or the other. We've got to have a proper perspective toward our possessions or else it will get in the way of loving God. You can't serve two masters, he tells us. In Luke chapter 18... Um, the, the magnificent story of the uh, rich official. In Matthew, it's the rich young man, but the story is basically the same. And he comes, we're using Luke 18, the official comes to uh, our Lord and says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, I really want this, I want more. 
uh, because I'm already keeping the commandments. Jesus said, well, keep the commandments. I'm doing that. I'm doing everything I need to do. So I want more. I want more. So, okay, our Lord puts the cards on the table. If you wish to be perfect, if you want the more of life, if you want more of life, then go sell what you have, give to the poor, you'll have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. And then St. Luke tells us he went away sad, for he was very rich. Couldn't let go. Jesus said, open your hands, give it away, follow me, and he had to keep grasping his wealth. So our Lord is teaching detachment if you would be perfect, if you truly would be a, an authentic disciple. And finally, Matthew chapter 10 was uh, the, the, a very difficult passage for any one of us because it invades, as it did in Abraham, the relationship with his son Isaac, this detachment that our Lord teaches invades even the tenderest of our human relationships. Matthew 10 is, whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. Whoever grasps. You know, friends, there's the old saying, I'm going to say it later, there are a lot of deaths that need to proceed, precede our final death. Because in the end, our hands are going to be open, and we're going to have to leave a go of everything. As they say, we take nothing with us, except our relationship with the Lord or not. And so opening our hands during life, I think, detachment prepares us for the final detachment when we enter and cross the threshold of the next life, eternal life. So letting go of things here is a little rehearsal when we'll have to let go. Doing it voluntarily will be the exercise that prepares us, I think, for an easier and happy death. But our Lord says here very clearly, even the tenderest of relationships, we have to be willing to let go. That's a demanding spiritual teaching from the lips of Jesus, and yet it must be at the core of Christian spirituality. It was at the core of the incarnation, who Jesus is, and it's at the core of who we are in Christ. If we would follow Christ to be worthy of him, as he says in Matthew 10, then his mind and heart must be our own. It's essential to develop that attitude of Christ uh, in ourselves and how we make space for the saving, life-giving power of God's grace. You see, detachment does that. It, it opens up a space in our lives for the grace of God to be more present and, and more active. So loosening our grasp on anything that reinforces our possessiveness, the original sin of grasping and taking a hold of something. Um, what, we're, what we're called to do by God's grace, not on our own, but by God's grace, is to uh, let go. Um, a, a great uh, spiritual um, writer uh, of the uh, late 13th and early 14th century, um, a, a German, Dominican uh, philosopher, theologian, and a mystic, uh, is named Meister Eckhart, Meister Eckhart. And uh, I have a, a, a his, uh, he argued that detachment is the fundamental Christian virtue. And we would say, well, I thought love was the greatest of all virtues. Isn't love uh, uh, first before anything else? And what he argues is that if we don't have detachment, love itself becomes self-serving. We, we, if we're attached even to our own uh, agenda, then uh, loving others becomes using them perhaps for something that is self-serving. And so he argued in that fashion that, that the fundamental virtue has to be detachment. Um, and uh, there is that a quote from him there that to be full of things is to be empty of God. To be empty of things is to be full of God. Meister Eckhart defines detachment in this way. He says, standing immovable 
against whatever may come, whether it is joy or sorrow, honor or shame, health or illness, pleasure or pain. And he uses the image uh, that we ought to be in life, whatever the situation we find ourselves in, we ought to be as immovable as a mountain of lead. And he said that mountain of lead will stand unmoved before um, the, the, the strongest of winds or the littlest breeze. Um, now that, I, I think if we think about this, that we, we're supposed to be immovable, that, that's not a, such an attractive thing in life. But if we really get to the guts of it, huh, it, it might sound impossible, it might sound unnatural, it might sound unhum, inhuman. Um, but I think that's only because we've grown up believing that our deepest human fulfillment comes from comfort and pleasure. You know, the highs of life, the things that, that pick me up, and that pain and suffering and shame and illness deprive us of deep fulfillment. But, but that's really a lie. Uh, Jesus tells us that it's a lie. You see, what, what our Lord wants us to know is that God alone is our deepest fulfillment. Not pleasure, not satisfaction, not success, but God alone is our deepest fulfillment. We were made for that to have God, and that fulfills us, and that God remains present to us, whether we're in joy or sorrow, honor or shame, health or sickness, God is with us, and therefore we should be immovable. It's not a matter of just toughing it out and saying I'm not, nothing affects me. Uh, there were the ancient uh, philosophers uh, who, um, uh, in Greek, uh, they, they felt you were supposed to be you know, unemotional, neutral about everything. Um, you know, oh, you, you just won a million dollars, oh, that's nice, and, and uh, your, your whole family just died, oh, I'm sorry. You know, that, 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 that's inhuman. But what, what uh, Meister Eckhart is saying is that when we have God at our core, then the outside circumstances uh, shouldn't move us. Isn't that what Jesus talks about in the Beatitudes? Huh? You know, blessed are the sorrowing, Bless, those aren't things that make us happy or blessed, but there are circumstances around us that don't have to control us unless we're grasping those things around us. So detachment is nothing more than ridding ourselves of the illusion that God is not enough. The illusion that God is not enough. Um, I, I went to uh, skip that. There's a, a great quote I, I always like, C.S. Lewis, and he said, he who has God and everything else has no more than he who has God alone. God is enough, God suffices. And there is this beautiful, perhaps you've heard of it, St. Teresa of Avila, the Spanish Carmelite reformer and mystic of the 16th century. St. Teresa of Avila, they call her the Big Teresa because there's little Teresa, the little flower. Well, Big Teresa, uh, after she died, they found in her breviary this handwritten prayer. And it's been called Teresa's, St. Teresa's bookmark because it was in her book, her, her book, her prayer book, the breviary. And it's a beautiful thing. It's very powerful in Spanish, but, but our English translation uh, would, would say, uh, let nothing disturb you. Let nothing frighten you. All things are passing. God never changes. Patience obtains all things. Nothing is wanting to him who possesses God. God alone suffices. Solo Dios basta is the uh, solo Dios basta. God alone is enough. So Saint Teresa must have prayed that prayer because it was it was in her uh, in her prayer book. So with that kind of context, this letting go, not grasping, not wanting to possess, uh, but knowing that when we possess God. We have everything we need. With that, I'd like to uh, look at the, um, um, the parable. And I, I don't want to read it again. We've, we've all heard it, but I want to read just the opening, the, the introduction, because the, the parable of the prodigal son is the third of three parables that our Lord tells. And, and uh, St. Uh, Luke tells us why he tells the parables, the three of them. Um, and I'm just going to read this, uh, just chapter 15, verse 1. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him, to hear him. And the Pharisees and the scribes murmured, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So our Lord tells three parables. He doesn't, he doesn't uh, engage in a theological dialogue or argument with them, but he tells three stories. Right? And of course the stories are because God is, God's love 
is so indescribable, undefinable, incomprehensible, and that's why Jesus told stories, right? Something they could relate to, go from the familiar to the unfamiliar, from the natural to the supernatural, because even our Lord couldn't put adequately into our human language divine love, divine mercy. And so he uses these stories, the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. So we have the, the parable of the prodigal son. Now, I like that introduction. I wanted to call that to your mind because this parable, the three parables, but let's focus on the third, the parable of the prodigal son, is told to justify his eating with sinners. He's being criticized for that. And so he tells that story to justify why he'll sit down with tax collectors and anybody that's willing to sit with him. Notice in the parable, what's the breaking point for the runaway son? Starvation. <laughs> he is hungry. He has nothing at all to eat. And the parable is really telling us one way to interpret it, that Jesus fulfills the deepest hunger of those sinners. They're looking for something, and as the song said, finding it in all the wrong places. But Jesus goes to have table fellowship with them to quench the deepest hunger of their hearts. And he presents himself to us as the only one who can do that. God alone is enough. To have God suffices over everything else. And so he fulfills the real hunger of those who have strayed, just as the kid comes to his senses when he experiences absolute starvation in the foreign land. So let's, let's take a look at, at this. Uh, you, we need to know, though, and this is important about everything about our Lord, that our Lord lived in that first century Jewish culture, which was an honor-based culture, right? where shame is to be avoided at all cost and anything that brings dishonor to your family is, is, is catastrophic. It's important to honor your family and bring only on. Anything that brings shame upon a family member is absolutely horrendous. Right? Um, you know, we never think of this, but um, in, in uh, our Lord's uh, calling away the fishermen, you know, uh, in, in, in that culture, uh, Peter and Andrew, uh, James and John are fishermen. Their fathers were fishermen. You can be sure their grandfathers were fishermen and their great-grandfathers were fishermen and their sons were intended to be fishermen. Those trades and professions went down the family line. That's how it worked. So when our Lord calls uh, Simon, Peter, and Andrew, and James and John away from their father's boat, that brings shame on their fathers. We never think of that. That was an extra cost that those men who followed Jesus and their families suffered because they were leaving the familial profession of fishing and following this itinerant preacher. And it brought shame on them and on their father. It was a cost that our Lord asked them to pay in walking with him as his disciples. So, so this is what it means to be in an honor-based culture. This is the context, the matrix in which our Lord lived and in which we have to understand this parable. Huh? Jesus tells the parable to justify his eating with sinners, as I said. Now let's look at the younger son. He brings shame on his father. Huh? How? Well, he is attached. He wants more. Right? He's already a privileged kid living with a rather wealthy situation there, but he wants, in a preemptive way, his father's inheritance what he would get when his father dies. In other words, he's telling his father, you might as well be dead. I want what's coming to me as my inheritance. That's a shameful attitude that the young son has toward his father. He wants more, wants more in his hands, and he gets it. Um, so he breaks the bond of family loyalties and the family support, and then what happens? He goes off because he wants independence. He, he wants to find himself, as we sometimes say, and he wants this autonomy, he wants to leave his father's house. So he goes off with all these new possessions in his hands, in his pockets, and he loses them. Somehow he wastes them. Not only does he waste them, but it would be an additional shame for this family that he wastes them in a non-Judean country. 
It's one thing to lose your money and your wealth to your fellow countrymen. It's a bigger disgrace to lose everything to a non-Jew, the dogs, the Gentiles. And so this heaps further shame. Jesus is building this case uh, uh, by, by describing what the young son is doing. He is humiliating his, his father. Um, so he wastes everything in a foreign land. He has nothing, and he finds himself tending pigs, which is verboten for a Jewish person to be around pigs, the unclean animals, and, uh, but that's what he's doing, and he can't even eat the fodder that's given to the pigs. No, nobody offers him anything. So what he finds himself in is a situation of detachment, got nothing, it's all been taken away from him, but it's involuntary. We find ourselves in situations sometimes where we had to give up something, which wasn't my idea. I, I didn't wish to do that, but it was taken. Involuntary detachment, but it's that involuntary detachment that opens his eyes. Yeah. He is in dire need, the parable tells us, and he receives a new clarity, something he never saw, that I'm going to go back to my father. I actually had it pretty good there, although I didn't know it. So I'm going to go back to my father. So there's the problem of the younger son, but the elder son isn't any better. The elder son heaps shame on his father in a different way. First of all, as the elder son in this culture, he would have had an obligation to try to reconcile that boy to his father. He should have run after him to, shame, to honor the family. This, the, the kid is shaming the family, and the elder brother has the responsibility to, to try to reconcile this kid. So he should have gone after his, older, his younger brother, and he doesn't. He doesn't. He doesn't care. He, he just lets him wander off. So he rejects that obligation and thus shaming the family. Um, not only doesn't he try to reconcile, he actively, once the kid comes home, he actively tries to divide father and brother. Um, he noticed when he speaks to his father, he does not use, uh, uh, the young son comes back and makes his little confession, father, I have sinned again. He uses the respectful title for his father. He's learned a lesson. He calls him father, I have sinned against heaven and against, I'm not worthy to be called your son. But the older brother talking to his father uses no title. There's no respect there for his father, more shame. Okay. Um, he, he refers to himself as a slave and not a son, and therefore he's accusing his father of a favoritism. Huh? All right, your, your son, I don't want to even call him his brother, but this son of yours has returned, but I've been a slave for you and you don't appreciate me. Right? You, you do not appreciate what I have tried to do for you. So both older son and younger son are a bundle of attachments. Uh, the younger son wanted material goods. He, he, he wanted that inheritance. The older son is attached to his feelings, his emotions, his hurts, the resentments, and he won't let go of those. He's grasped. So, so we can grasp onto material things, but we can also grasp onto um, um, spiritual or non-material non non-material things. Um, I, I would um, point out... Um, find where we are here. Um, yeah. Uh, before we look at the main figure in the parable, it's always called the prior prodigal son, but in fact the main figure of this, this parable is the father. It's the father who's prodigal. The father is prodigal of um, mercy, forgiveness, love, reconciliation. He's reckless when it comes to those things, absolutely counter to the culture in which he finds himself. But before we look at the, the main figure, the father, I, I would like to point out that it might be helpful for us to reflect a little bit on these two sons as representing or symbolic of the two halves of our lives. And the, the things that they're struggling with very much are the things that we struggle with in different phases of our life as men in particular. Right? I think they have a particular significance to our spiritual lives if we see them as symbolic of two halves of our own lives. First of all, the younger son. 
What's he dealing with? Well, independence, finding his own way, money and possessions, and sexuality. The older brother observes that he spent money on harlots. And isn't it true that oftentimes in our own lives, young adulthood and middle age is trying to get those things in right order, trying to live in harmony with our own independence and finding our way in life, with money and possessions, what are the proper place of those things in our life and our human sexuality as men, getting those in the right order many times are the very struggles that we're preoccupied with and oftentimes the subject of our confessions uh, when we have to admit our sinfulness. And then what? What about the older son? Well, in the Middle Ages and the later years of our life, another set of struggles can affect us. And they're the struggles of the older brother. Huh? Struggles like, life isn't fair. Right? Um, I get too little thanks from the people I've been good to. Um, there were various resentments of things that never happened but should have in my life. Envy others' success or situations that they enjoy that I don't. I never got the recognition that I deserved when I had that job. To be jealous of someone or some things. Those are very much the struggles, I think, of middle age and later life. The struggles that plague us and we have to deal with and get them in right order before we have to let go of everything and pass to the next life. So what's the answer here in both of these, the younger son and the, the older son? The answer is to resolve these, to heal these, requires detachment. To be detached even from those sentiments of being cheated. Life isn't fair. Uh, nobody thanks me. I resent the things that have happened. I carry those grudges. Let go. Open our hands. Let go of those. As well as in the younger times of life, that the possessions, money, sexuality, and uh, independence and uh, autonomy. Those are the things, and I think it helps us if you consider and pray with that parable again and think of them as stages of our life. The things that the older and younger son are dealing with are the very things that you and I have to deal with, and the only way we'll get them in right order is opening our hands, not being grasping, not being controlling. So let's look at this father who is extraordinary. The father, um, first of all, those who heard our Lord tell this parable, when that boy came up, they would have been shocked that the father goes and runs to meet. Obviously, that meant that he was watching. He was vigilantly waiting for the son to return. So he's, he's looking on the horizon, and when he sees the boy approaching, the, walking on the property, he runs out. Now that would have shocked, because it's a shame and honor-based culture. That would have shocked the, the first hearers of this parable. They would have expected the father to wait there, perhaps with his arms crossed, and when the son begins his uh, confession that I have uh, sinned against uh, God and against you, um, uh, they would have expected the father to explode at the kid, to uh, discipline him or shun him. All right, you get what you deserve. You've created this situation, now go live with it. Get out of here. That's what would have been normal. But this father is not defined by the culture in which he lives. He's not defined by that shame, that honor shame matrix. But rather, his actions are shocking in that context. He runs to greet and welcome the boy home. He gets the best robe for his return. So where do you think that came from? His closet. <laughs> Who's going to have a better robe than the father in this wealthy household? So obviously he's giving him a robe from his own wardrobe uh, that the son can put on because he's, he's miserable. You ever see the, um, oh, who's the uh, famous, uh, I saw it, it's in the uh, uh, in St. Petersburg uh, Museum, the, uh, the famous prodigal son, Return of the Prodigal Son, and I mean, he looks a mess, and the shoes are falling off his feet. Um, uh, Rembrandt, yeah, the Rembrandt's uh, painting of the, uh, uh, in the Hermitage in St. Petersburg, it's a, a, an amazing portrayal, and it has the, the return prodigal son just looking absolutely one big mess. Uh, but now the father's reclothing him, right? 
get a robe out of my closet, the best robe, and put it on him. And then he wants him to have sandals. Now that's not just the fact that his shoes were falling apart or didn't have any shoes, um, but rather to wear shoes is a sign of a free man. Servants, slaves were barefooted. And to put shoes on his son is saying, you are a free man, you are not my slave and you're not going to be a servant in the house. Remember, he said, I'll, I'll work for you. I'll, I'll, I'll be happy if you hire me to do work. Father won't hear of that. So putting shoes on him means you're a free man. You're not a servant. You're not a slave. And, and then, of course, the ring, and probably by that, the word uh, for ring is probably meant a signet ring with the, with the initial or the family shield, a seal or something on it. And so by put, putting that ring on his finger, it's a sign that he is restored as a family member. He's not just going to be a guest. Uh, there's, there's nothing hanging over his head. He's restored to full family membership. And then, of course, the part about the fatted calf. Um, uh, I, I always remember uh, uh, the, the, the question of the, the uh, teacher with the um, uh, religious ed class, and they said, and they told the parable of the prodigal son, and they said, now, who was really, really unhappy when the prodigal son returned home? And this little kid had a wave in his hand, so the teacher said, oh, here, this is going to be a sure thing. He said, yes, who was really, really unhappy when the, when the prodigal son returned home? And the little boy said, the fatted calf. <laughs> <laughs> So he was unhappy because he's, he's, he's cooking. And, and the, but the idea of the fatted calf is, is certainly it's a celebration for the family. But this, I mean, this is a lot of meat, which means that the whole town is going to share in this celebration of reconciliation. The father didn't do this undercover. You know, don't tell anybody because they'll laugh at me or they'll mock me because what I've done with my son. No, no, this is a big public celebration of reconciling the son. And the fatted calf designates that. He's not doing this in the secrecy of their home, but the whole town is going to enter into this great celebration. So, um, the parable ends with the dad outside trying to convince his elder son, who has all these resentments, holding on to the hurt feelings, trying to convince him to come in. Come into the party, come into the feast, and it ends abruptly. We don't know. Can he detach himself from those feelings? Can he grab forgiveness, reconciliation, the fraternal esteem that he should have for his younger brother? Can, can he let go of his own hard, hurt feelings and grab onto something of higher value, the values of the kingdom of God? And we don't know. Our Lord purposely leaves the parable open so that we have to ask ourselves the same question. Yeah. Are we willing to go into the feast? Can we let go? Can we join the household of our Lord, the household of the Father, if I let go of what I have to let go of in order to enter? So it, it leaves us with the same question to ponder about ourselves. Can I learn detachment? Will I open my hands let go of those hurt things that are in my head and heart. So, um, our theme today is uh, men called to be saints. And when we look at the lives of saints, we see that they had the grace of detachment. Yeah? Very often it meant something radical, like the Franciscans and Francis. We heard something from St. Francis, from Dr. Bergsman. That was radical poverty, radical detachment. That's obviously not my call. It's not your call. But what is our call is the proper regard, the proper attitude toward what we have. And these things can easily become idols. They can become the center and the purpose, the meaning of our lives. And once again, there are only one who gives us meaning, only one who can be at the center, and it's Jesus. So the lives of the saints, beginning with our Blessed Mother, of course, show us um, that uh, detachment is necessary for sanctity um, in order to create place for God's powerful grace to come into our lives. Um, and sometimes what we have to give up is not evil, we have to let go of something that's good, but for a higher spiritual good, or the highest spiritual good, Christ himself. 
We can let go of things that are good in themselves, but at times can become obstacles to God's grace in our lives. So we're called to a greater freedom. When we think sometimes this is going to make me free or if I can do this, I'll be free, many times it's a lie. Our true freedom comes from having God. God alone, God alone suffices. Um, St. Paul, Colossians 3, 5, sa says this, um, put to death then the parts of you that are earthly, immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and the greed that is idolatry. That's the phrase that uh, struck me there, greed, and that's that holding on to, grabbing, wanting to hold and possess. And when we do that, when our hands are wrapped around anything, it can easily become an idol, a false god. And we can find our meaning and our purpose in that false god. Um, many times we think, well, that first commandment, I've never, I've had people, well, you know, I never, I've never worshipped an idol. Oh, are you sure? <laughs> are you sure you've not worshipped an idol? because it's probably one of the commandments that's broken more often than we think. And we make, we make a little God, little G, out of so many, so many things in our lives. At least that's a temptation. So Paul recognizes that greed is idolatry, and, and he's saying, let it go. Right? Don't hold on to these things if you would be alive in Christ. You've got to put to death these other things that only will get in the way. So when we are attached, we are attached to anything inordinately in a disordered attachment, we are saying to God's face, you are not enough. I need this. I have to hold on to this feeling. I can't let this go. It's too hurtful. And you're not enough. So just think of it that way. It's a reverse way of saying that when we, when we truly have an inordinate grasp on anything, we're looking at God and saying, Lord, you are not enough. Lord, you alone do not suffice. I need this. I need that. I have to have this. And the answer is, no, you don't. And we'll learn that. Let's not hope we learn it too late. Saints prayed for this grace to know that God is all sufficient. And through that, they became free free to serve God, free to serve others, and people noticed their holiness because they understood that God alone was enough. So detachment really, in the bottom line, is nothing more than ridding myself of the illusion that God is not enough. That's really the bottom line on detachment, to understand that God alone suffices, not only in my head, but to have it in my heart, which will filter into the life that I live. So I think that gives us 10, sec uh, 10, sec 10 minutes uh, left uh, this morning, brothers. I, if, would anyone like to make a comment or ask a question? Um, yeah, yes, sir. I have to speak pretty loudly. I'm way up there. Uh -huh. I'll repeat, um, our brother here said that he's had three children, his oldest daughter died, uh, and he had to open his hands and, and let he realize he doesn't control his children, and the two other daughters have left the church, and they're living their lives independently, and once again, he's had to say, I, I can't control that. You can continue to pray, certainly, for their return, witness your own faith, but th there's no way that you can enforce um, uh, their return to the church. I think if they, they see your faith, perhaps God's grace will at some point br bring them back. But it, it, it is a very, it's a sobering lesson when we lose a loved one, but uh, it, it also is, uh, it, it makes it very clear that, that we don't possess one another. Yeah? God possesses us, 
but we don't, we're, what, we are not, a, and, and when, I, when, we, when we think we own or control another person, it, it becomes very dangerous. And we, we don't respect the dignity uh, of the other, but they're there for our uh, good, they're there to, to serve my needs, and that becomes a very disordered um, uh, situation in life. But th thank you for sharing that, because and, and in a sense, those are involuntary detachments but you've got to learn to say, I've got to let go and, and entrust them to God. Because God does possess them still, no matter how far they've strayed, uh, they're in God's hands and, and pray that somehow they'll realize that and return to uh, the body of Christ actively in the church. Thank you for sharing that. Any other? Yeah, yes, sir. Uh, I'm Emotional? The older brother. Yeah. Yeah, I was just thinking about you know, these relationships that are so, oh, thank you. Um, these relationships that are so close, like family relationships. Uh, and it seems like there's this, maybe a temptation, we could either go in the direction of compassion, or we could go the opposite towards indifference, kind of like the Stoics that you were uh, alluding to. Mm -hmm. and so I'm kind of curious, how, how do we allow God to drive us in that direction of compassion and not kind of fall into, say, an indifference, like a, a, a detachment that kind of separates us rather than, than unites us, especially to the ones who are, are closest to us. I, I, just say, what's a, exactly the question again? A little, I, I, the speakers are going okay. out, so. Yeah, um, so with detachment, uh, Deta yeah. driving us towards compassion rather than indifference, how can, in our relationship with our uh, people closest to us, like family members, for instance, how can um, we allow God to help drive us towards compassion rather than towards help, help drive us forward? Did you say help, mm -hmm. uh, like, in, instead of instead of maybe backwards? And I don't, I don't care about you. I can't care about you. God's yeah, yeah. I, I just one. one I don't know if this will help, but it, it, this is what comes to my mind. Um, I remember as a young priest, this was unusual, I don't know why the bishop did it, but I was just ordained and I was made confessor to a group of sisters, a convent. And usually you were ordained 10 years or so before you were allowed to, and they probably made a mistake, but anyway, I was, <laughs> I was assigned to hear the sisters' confessions. And, uh, but, but once, we, I, and, and sister was explaining some things to me, and, and it was about uh, within the community and being hurt by opinions and statements and attitudes and and it came to me to say, you know, maybe you could just think that given their whole history, their beginning with their growing up and, and their whole experience, maybe this is the best they can do. And I think that is a very charitable judgment to make about one another. When someone steps on our feet, uh, when someone we hear said something about us that's really um, negative, um, when we've been hurt in some way, to be able to say to ourselves and to God, maybe that's the best thing that person could do in that situation. And it becomes, I think, that kind assessment of their fault uh, is a help to me. Yeah. Give, given their life's journey, given what has happened to them, given to where they are, given to their relationship, this is the best he or she could do in this situation. And, and I think that gentle, kind assessment helps me accept without bitterness or carrying the grudge or, or um, looking for vengeance. Well, here in today's uh, first reading, it's a beautiful reading from Jeremiah, but it ends with, take vengeance on them, O God. You know, <laughs> they want my life, I want you to take their life. So I, I, I don't know if that's a help. But I, I would ask everybody to consider that. Next time somebody um, rubs you the wrong way and, and you, you're carrying some cross that uh, somebody put on your shoulder, just say, maybe that's the best he or she could do in this situation. Rather than saying, how could you? I'll never forgive, I'll forgive. No, no. they might have been acting at their best level given who they are and let it go at that. Okay, well, I want to, oh, way, way over there, yeah, can we? Uh, the father, um, 
can, is often viewed by the mother uh, as being indifferent or stoic rather than detached. And the mother uh, holds on to her grieving. She, um, you know, the mother cannot let go at all. Uh, but on the other hand, she may have a point about the father uh, being indifferent or stoic rather than detached. I think the other questioner was, was bringing that up a little bit as well. Um, you know, could you talk a little bit about detachment versus indifference? Yeah. Thank, thank you for that. It, it is true that this father shows what we might consider more maternal love. Um, it, it's sometimes distinguished that uh, our, the, the fatherly love is more conditioned on behavior, whereas maternal love is un, more unconditional. You know, I love you because you're my son. I love you because you're my daughter. Doesn't matter what you, and, and we tend to put some more strings on that. Not that you don't love, but you may not be as effusive with your love if, if the kid is misbehaving or dishonoring or what, what have you. So I think you know, what we learn in Genesis is that male and female are the image of God. And together we have a, a more, we don't have the total picture, but we have a more complete in masculinity and femininity. We have uh, a little bit fuller picture of who God is. And, um, and oftentimes, and it, not just in the New Testament, in the Old Testament, um, that, that maternal love is also attributed rightly because God you know, made us male and female to reflect something of his reality. And, and so God is, has those attributes. And it, certainly in this parable, I would say the father um, does demonstrate that those, uh, uh, the, the, the warmth, you might say, of, of maternal love. He doesn't demand any conditions from his son, just happy that he came home. Okay, what well, is quarter after? So thank you very much. I appreciate, appreciate the opportunity. Thank you.